In this video, we are going to take a look at the concept of virtualization. This essentially relates to two topics. One is the implementation of virtual memory and eventually to the concept of how we can implement virtual machines. So first of all, what do we mean by virtualization? The basic idea of virtualization is to isolate programs from each other. In other words, can we sort of give one program the illusion that it is the only program running on a CPU, while in fact we are actually running other programs as well in a time sharing fashion. And while doing so, how do we protect programs from the problems of how having to manage memory and also from having their memory written upon by someone else who should not normally be able to. So the idea of virtual memory basically relates to the problem of can multiple programs run on a CPU at the same time? And if we are talking about a single core CPU, strictly speaking, the answer is no. At a given point in time, there can only be one instruction executing on the CPU. But by doing some kind of time sharing, we can give the illusion that multiple programs are running on a CPU simultaneously. In other words, the CPU can jump from one to the other or context switch fast enough that the user cannot really tell the difference and gets the feeling that many things are happening on the CPU at the same time. A related question of course then becomes, given a program running on a CPU, should it always be loaded into the same area of memory? The way to look at this would be, if we have a certain memory space, a memory map, how does a program encode the loads and stores that it needs? In other words, can a program always assume that it is going to be executed between locations, let's say 1000 to 2000? And perhaps another program, program B, executes from 2500 to 4000. But what happens if along comes a program C that has been written in such a way that it needs to access locations from, let's say, 1500 to 3000? It would end up overlapping with the address locations that have been specified for program A and program B. One way to avoid this, of course, would be that the author of program A and the author of program C get together and decide ahead of time that this is the memory address specified for each of their programs. This is clearly impractical, especially when many different people are likely to write programs and you might want to actually get programs from different sources to run on the same system. It also means portability is a problem. Let's say that you wrote a program which assumes that it has access to a certain range of memory addresses and you then want to give that to someone else who has a different amount of memory in their system. How are you going to manage this? Another related question that comes up is, what happens when a program needs more memory than is currently free in the system? Does it mean that the program should stop or should give up or be killed? Or can some mechanism be used in order to find out whether there are other programs that have been using up some memory but are currently sleeping or not really using the memory. Perhaps they are waiting for data to come back from somewhere or perhaps they are just background processes that need to wake up once per hour and do some work before going back to sleep. If so, perhaps some of the memory that they are using can be freed up. How do we do that? Perhaps we could take that data and save it to some slower but larger memory block, essentially going in some kind of a cache hierarchy. But in principle, we could also be going all the way out to disk. We could be storing parts of the memory out onto disk in order to free up the physical RAM of the system for other programs that need it right away. The bottom line over here is that individual programs should not need to know specific memory addresses. In other words, can they be designed or can the programs or the compilers be written in such a way that individual programs have their own address space where they are given the illusion that they have absolute control over what goes into every memory location 
and the actual specifics of what a given memory address corresponds to on the hardware is taken care of separately. In other words, can we create virtual addresses that are used by the program that then need to get mapped onto physical addresses in order to actually run? So the idea of virtual memory is to assign a separate address space to each program. The compiler assumes it has full access to this address space and no other program can read or write these addresses. Typically, this is done in coordination with an operating system. The operating system loads the program into physical memory and takes care of ad adjusting any addresses that are required within the program itself. The ELF format is one of the mechanisms by which this is made feasible. The addresses used in the ELF format are all virtual addresses. And part of the problem of loading the program into physical memory is resolving those virtual addresses. Now, the important point over here, of course, is that there is some notion of address translation that is going to be required over here. Because if a program generates a given address, let's say it uses a pointer, and it generates an address, we need to know whether this is actually a physical address or whether we need to do some kind of a translation in order to convert it from the virtual address that the program believes it is accessing to a physical address that actually corresponds to some storage on the system. This is typically done using a concept of something called a page. A block of virtual memory is called a page. Typically, a page could be, let's say, four kilobytes of memory. It could be smaller, perhaps one kilobyte, or it could even be larger, 16 or 64 kilobytes. As you would imagine, these numbers, 4, 16, 64, are essentially for convenience because they correspond to blocks of addresses that occupy fixed number of bits of the address, this bus. Now, the program that is actually running inside the processor produces virtual addresses. Let's say that you had int star p. The star p is essentially a pointer. And p will therefore have values which could be treated as integers, but ultimately correspond to virtual addresses in the address space of the pro program. There has to be one stage that converts that virtual address into a physical address. And this is typically a combination of hardware and software. Now, once it has been converted to a physical address, that must correspond to some physical memory storage. Otherwise, there's essentially a problem with the system. The translation has gone wrong because a physical address, by definition, corresponds to physical memory. The virtual address may or may not correspond to something that actually exists. Now, this combination of hardware and software that is used to translate the physical address, translate the virtual address into a physical address is in addition to all the rest of the hardware that's already present in the CPU. In general, this is something called a memory management unit that enables this kind of translation to be done. Here is an example of what this translation might look like. Let's consider a situation where we have a 48-bit virtual address. You may recall from one of the earlier videos that the LSCPU command gives the number of bits of the virtual address space that a CPU can use. In this case, I'm essentially saying that even if the 64-bit processor is potentially capable of accessing 64 bits of address space, the actual virtual address is only 48 bits. Now, what this means is that we take one part of that and call it the page offset, which means that it is the location of a given byte or word inside a page. And the remaining address bits, the higher order bits, essentially correspond to a virtual page number. As you can see over here, we are considering a page size of 4 kilobytes, corresponding to 12 bits of address. And the remaining 36 bits, 48 minus 12, 36 bits corresponds to the virtual page number. Now, those 36 bits are translated down into 28 bits correspond to a, corresponding to a physical page number. In other words, what we have done is we have taken the 48-bit virtual address and converted it into a 40-bit physical address. 
does this mean that we actually have 40 bits of addressable memory? In other words, one terabyte of addressable memory? Not necessarily. It just means that this is the maximum amount that can be handled by the system. 40 bits corresponds essentially to one terabyte of address space, just like 30 bits would correspond to one gigabyte. But that does not necessarily mean that we are talking about a system with one terabyte of RAM. All that we are saying is it can have a maximum of one terabyte of RAM. If in turn we find that the physical page number that we have created does not correspond to any actual hardware memory, that would correspond to an exception and would be handled separately. As you can see over here, this virtual address to physical address translation can be done by using some kind of lookup tables. And more interestingly, we could also have a mix of different kinds of translations. There is no reason why virtual addresses need to map into physical addresses in the same order in which they exist in the virtual address space. And also interestingly, certain virtual addresses might actually get mapped onto external disk. They may not even correspond to physical addresses. In particular, this is what is used in the mechanism that you might have come across called swap. Swap space is essentially an external area of storage, which corresponds to external disk. All that it says is that if a virtual address is mapped to an address that is in the swap space, then we can actually take the data out of the physical memory and put it into the disk while retaining the same virtual address. So the operating system would then take care of copying a block of data out of a physical range of addresses into a given range on the disk and just updating the virtual address mapping so that instead of pointing to a physical address in the RAM of the system, it now points to somewhere on the disk. As far as the program is concerned, nothing has changed. When it tries to access something from the virtual address, which is now on disk, it would essentially undergo something called a page fault. And that would result in the virtual address, the operating system waking up, pulling the data out of the disk, putting it back into physical memory and updating the virtual address to physical address translation so that now the data comes from the RAM. So a page fault, in other words, is how memory allocation is handled. When memory is allocated, this is initially just virtual memory. However, when it is accessed, it has to correspond to some kind of physical memory because you need to be able to retrieve specific values from there. Now, since we have only allocated it and it is still virtual, this would result in something called a page fault since there is no physical mapping. The operating system then takes care of trying to find an appropriate physical memory location. If there is a free page in memory, then it performs the mapping. It takes a translation that this virtual address corresponds to this physical address, maps it and continues. If you're trying to write to that location in memory, it would update the physical contents of the memory. If you're trying to read from it, it would give you whatever was the value sitting over there. Now, it is also possible that these pages could be on disk. And if so, the operating system would then take care of appropriately managing how you get the data back from there. Keep in mind that accessing a page from disk can take millions of clock cycles. We already saw that disk access times can be on the order of milliseconds, which means that we could end up spending millions of clock cycles in order to access a single page of data from disk. Some of you may have come across a situation on Linux machines perhaps, or possibly even on Windows machines, where you actually encounter swapping or thrashing, which is a situation where your system has started running out of memory is swapping data onto disk and those programs that have been swapped out to disk are then trying to wake up and run. Every time that happens, the operating system tries to pull their data back onto the uh, back into the main memory. In order to do so, it has to take some other program and write it back out onto the disk. Each and every one of these operations starts to take thousands or millions of clock cycles and the overall response of your system can become very, very slow. So why would one ever use swap in such a situation? It cannot be used to help in a situation where you are actually short of memory. But let's say that you had only temporarily run short of memory due to some allocation that was required by one program, which is short running. And after it finished, it essentially freed up all the memory. 
perhaps it needed access to a very large part or almost all of the RAM in your system, but for a relatively short duration. In such a situation, the operating system could safely swap out all the other processes, let this program run, and once it has finished running, it could bring the other programs back from swap into main memory. And everything would run fine because it would just be a few milliseconds that are lost in terms of translating the data once onto disk and once back. Now, the actual implementation of virtual memory in this way is fairly involved. It involves a lot of concepts. There are page tables, multi-level page tables, hierarchies, translation look-aside buffers, a lot of terminology that goes into understanding how these things can be implemented in an efficient manner. And as far as this course is concerned, we are going to leave it at that and not really look further into it. Those who are interested would probably want to look at systems level courses, for example, operating systems and so on would need to understand all of these concepts in order to actually be implemented efficiently. All of this leads us to one further idea. If we can have virtual memory where each program essentially thinks it is the only program running on the computer, can we take this memory isolation all the way and run an operating system itself as one of the programs? In other words, can we run multiple operating systems simultaneously on the same CPU? each one in a time sharing fashion, such that each of those operating systems thinks that it has control over the entire computer. And you could have multiple operating systems and multiple effective virtual machines that are time sharing the existing system. Now, there are several problems with this approach of virtualization. And one of the more significant ones is how do we handle shared resources? In particular, after all, the system will typically have only one keyboard, one screen, one mouse, one ethernet card, and so on. How do you handle this when multiple operating systems each thinks that it owns the keyboard, the mouse, the video display, and so on? Clearly, each of these IO peripherals also needs to be virtualized in such a way that the virtual operating systems are not able to tell the difference and think that they are managing the entire computer Whereas there is actually some other program, a top level supervisor, the commonly used term is actually hypervisor, that manages multiple systems sharing the CPU. Now, what happens if you get interrupts or exceptions? There are a number of things to care about over here. Exceptions in one program or operating system should not affect others. Let's say that you try to access the wrong memory or you do a divide by zero in one program, that should not cause other programs or other operating systems that are sharing the same CPU to even be affected in any minor way. Moreover, interrupts or exceptions should also be routed to the correct target. You need to make sure that if there is a particular virtual machine or operating system that is supposed to respond to interrupts in a specific situation, that's the only one that should get the input corresponding to that interrupt and should be able to respond to it. Similarly, we might also want to create virtualized ethernet cards, virtualized keyboards, virtualized displays, and so on, so that each of the different operating systems does not really know that it is not the one fully in charge of the, system, of the computer. All this, of course, requires some concept of something called privileged instructions. And the idea of privileged instructions is that a general program that has been written by a user should not ideally be able to access all the parts of the system. In other words, it should not be able to, for example, change the interrupt handling routines or have access to protected registers in the hardware. Any accesses to any of any such devices should get routed through the hypervisor. This is usually done by means of something called traps. And trap is similar to the idea of an exception. It essentially says that any time that there is some behavior inside the virtual machine that should not be allowed since it would affect the host processor or the main system in some way, 
any such instruction should immediately trap to the virtual machine monitor or the hypervisor. And if necessary, that monitor or hypervisor can even modify virtual machine code so that it can force traps in specific places. For example, if a virtual machine tries to access or modify a privileged register, perhaps one that gives the state of the system, that will actually cause a trap which goes into the host and the host may actually decide that rather than giving it the actual value in that privileged register, it will emulate some kind of a privileged register specifically for this CPU and give back that value. All of this is ideally done with good amount of support from the instruction set architecture itself. And this is where a lot of difference comes into the different instruction sets. For example, simple microcontrollers, perhaps the one that's used in an Arduino, typically do not even have a memory management unit. And in general, they cannot run an operating system like Linux. They may be able to run some spe specific specialized operating systems that have limited capabilities, but can run without a memory management unit. But Linux by itself assumes that virtual memory is possible to implement. And this cannot be done unless you have a memory management unit. The ISA would also require privileged instructions for the simple reason that it needs to be able to separate out the behavior of the operating system kernel, which has full control of the hardware, versus something that is running in user space, that is, is effectively a program being run by some individual user. This means that any attempt from user space to directly access hardware, for example, will lead to a kernel trap and the kernel will then take care of responding appropriately to the program in user space. It might deny access altogether or it might emulate the behavior that is expected by the user space program and give back some suitable values. This means that different processors, as mentioned, have different amounts of support for virtualization. The IBM Z series and other related mainframe hardware architectures are excellent examples that existed well before virtualization was possible in architectures like the x86. Recent x86 processors have a moderate to good amount of support for virtualization. There are still some issues, especially in terms of how interrupts are handled and so on. For example, some of the flags that are set inside the processor are done in such a way that it is difficult to really virtualize them in a convenient manner. And relatively old x86 architectures and older versions of the ARM architecture, just like microcontrollers, essentially have next to no support for virtualization. It is still possible to implement some kind of virtual machines over there, but it would require extensive modifications or runtime changes to the code. As mentioned earlier, one of the things that a hypervisor could do would actually be to go and replace instructions at specific locations inside the hosts, inside the virtual machine code, so that anytime such an instruction is encountered, it would raise an exception, which could then be handled by the virtual machine monitor in order to implement some kind of virtualization. Performance wise, this would clearly take a fairly severe hit, which is why instruction ISA level support for virtualization is essential in all modern computers.